Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Ratner. I am the director of the Donia Human Rights Center at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you both in the room and uh, on Zoom to our um, wonderful um, and uh, timely event on documenting atrocities, overcoming barriers in Syria um, with Mohammed Al Abdallah. I'll just, I just want to make a few very brief announcements before I, I turn the, um, the floor over to our panelists. Um, first, um, since our, we've already begun our, our monthly speaker series with a wonderful event last month on the legacy of 9-11 for human rights protection or the lack thereof, uh, we've also, since that time, initiated our new uh, Donia Human Rights Fellows Program for undergraduates who are in the PICS major, giving them a chance to have a recognition for taking human rights courses while undergraduates. And we um, expect to know later this week how many students will be participating in that program. I also want to announce that we recently decided to award our first uh, faculty grant for book preparation to Melissa Borja, in the assistant professor in the Department of American Culture and Program in Asian Pacific Islander American Studies for a conference she'll be putting on next year about Asian American religions, religious freedom, and the state. So congratulations to Melissa on that uh, award of $10,000. Um, finally, for those of you who look at our website, uh, we're going to be initiating within a week or so a new page on our website for publications either resulting from student internships or from faculty who are our faculty associates. Uh, we had a, uh, one of our student interns last year who worked in Belfast or at an NGO in Belfast uh, was a contributor to a very important report um, about the Northern Ireland Protocol that was actually a protocol that was mentioned in today's New York Times. And her report is going to be one of the first documents on our website, so we'll be happy to feature it there. Uh, but now um, I'd like to turn the floor over uh, to Professor Lee Pierce, um, who is a professor in the uh, School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, professor of e epidemiology. Her specialty is in the etiology and prevention of ovarian and breast cancers. Um, more um, to uh, the subject of our, of our event today, she is also teaching a, um, a course in the public health school on health evidence and human rights. So this is uh, something that is within her area of expertise, and we're delighted that she's agreed to, to moderate um, our event today with uh, Mohammed Abdullah. And I uh, welcome both of you to the Donia Center and look forward to a stimulating afternoon. Thank you very much. Welcome. It's exciting to be in person with all of you here today. And then we have more than 30 participants who have joined us online. So um, I can't tell you how fortunate we are to have um, Muhammad Al Abdallah here with us today. We have agreed that I will call him Muhammad and he will call me Lee. We'll have a little bit of an informal discussion. Um, Mohammed is the executive director of the Syrian Justice and Accountability Center. He is a lawyer who has been working in human rights for much of his career, previously at Human Rights Watch, working in Lebanon but on issues in Syria. He has also his own personal journey with um, human rights uh, abuses which he will talk a little bit about today as well. Um, as we get ready to hear um, about the work that Mohammed is doing, I'll just put a little bit of context around um, the issues and Syria in general, um, in case not everyone here or online is um, as familiar. So just to remind everyone, in 1920, Syria was occupied or colonized by France, and they stayed in control in theory until 1941. But in 1946, we had Evacuation Day, which was the day um, that the French finally left um, Syria. And from 1946 until around the, the early 1960s, it was just, I don't know, I guess I would characterize it as a little bit of chaos in Syria um, until the early 60s when the Ba'ath Party really started to take control of the country. And uh, a gentleman, Hafez 
um, al-Assad, who grew up in really quite impoverished um, conditions and was a member of one of the um, uh, less um, common uh, religious groups, Alawi, um, rose up through the ranks in the Ba'ath Party and in 1970 became president. And we've really, in Syria, had 50 years of Assad family rule. In uh, 2000, Hafez al-Assad passed away and his son um, Bashar came into power and has been in power since. Initially, when he came into power, it looked like maybe he would be a bit of a reformist. Many people were let out of prison, and it was a time of relative hope, I would say, but that was relatively short-lived. You had the first US, um, or the second, actually, US uh, invasion in Iraq caused some uh, discomfort for him, and uh, things started to deteriorate from a human rights perspective in the, in the country. And then 2005, the assassination of the former uh, Lebanese prime minister was heavily um, uh, blamed on Assad, and that created even more contentious situation in the country. Fast forward a few years, the Arab Spring began in Tunisia, and there were various movements across um, Arab nations. Eventually, in 2011, in um, Syria, we had the initial protests. And I think at the beginning, there was a little bit of hope that maybe there would be some concessions, but that was quickly uh, not realized, I guess. And, um, and so from there, we have a whole new set of human rights abuses, and both by the Syrian government, but also uh, non-state actors, as well as other countries, Russia and the US, um, involved. And so I think now I'll turn it over to Mohammed, who will put the, his current work in the context of what's really been going on there for the last 10 years. Thank you very much, Lee, and thank you for the Dunya Center. Thanks, Professor Ratner, for having me here. It's good to be in person, and thanks for our guests online as well. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Abdullah. I'm from Syria, from Deir ez Zor originally. It's a small province on the side of Syria. If this is working, it's somewhere clearly where the green triangle is there. We'll get back to this map in a minute. Uh, my family lives in Damascus. And we were part of the human rights movement prior to the conflict in Syria, uh, where we started uh, working in different human rights issues. My father is a writer, and because of his writing, he's a political writer, columnist. Uh, he ended up imprisoned a couple of times. A um, couple of times when I was a teenager, but later when I was a grown up, and also some pictures of uh, uh, my experience with him. Um, I was part of the human rights movement since 2003, 2004. Um, Primarily, we were focused on political detention in the country and representing political prisoners who are facing trials, usually for charges on political grounds. And the charges are very broad, broadcasting false news, weakening the national sentiment of the nation, which could be anything, really, if you interpret it this way. Uh, I ended up in prison myself. That's me there on the right. And I ended up meeting my father in prison, actually. That's him on the left. We ended up in a military court together for a case in 2006. I met with him in Sadnaya military prison in 2006. And this is a very rare picture, the top one in the Adra prison and the second one in the military court of Damascus. Uh, but going back to, to uh, Lee, what, what Lee explained and put the context, and thank you very much for that. We had a wave of change starting in Tunisia, going to Egypt, then Libya, Bahrain, Yemen, and Syria. Clearly not all of them were positive, not all of them were peaceful. We got a US and NATO intervention in Libya because President Gaddafi was 
crazy and he decided to kill everybody from day one and the international community freaked out, passed a resolution in the UN uh, to protect civilians in Libya. Unfortunately, we didn't get that in Syria. An international protection or peacekeeping forces or any international intervention to keep Syrians safe. So the result is this today. And this is a very interesting map because always thought of Syria as a very, very, very centralized, centralized state. Everything is in the hand of Damascus. They control everything and they call the shots and everything. And we'll get to that in details a little bit. But here we have lots of parties on this map. You have the yellow area controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the Kurdish forces who fought along the U.S. side against ISIS, of course with the U.S. military presence, all that third across the river. The pink area is controlled by the Syrian government with Russia and Iran, both are present militarily in Syria. The small base there, uh, alternative base on the south is by the opposition groups, but U.S. allies as well, U.S. and British forces there. The northern side in the green is with the rebels, with different groups, including Al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra, and the brown belt on the top is areas that Turkey seized in different operations against the Kurds in the, in the, in the north. So if you look at Syria today, we'll see the Syrian government forces, but also we see the US. France has some ground troops there, UK. Germany is participating in the, in the uh, uh, coalition against ISIS. We have uh, Russia militarily in Syria, Iran, militias from Iraq, Lebanon. We get the Israeli air forces bombing every other day, if not every night in Syria. So we get like really crowded government presence and parties. But a very important features, and we'll speak about more through the details, is the rise of non-state actors during the conflict. And this is very important throughout the entire region, not only for Syria. Libya had a lot of non-state actors. Egypt had some non-state actors. Iraq, definitely Yemen and, and Syria, but Syria is very, very inflated. We have a lot, of, a lot of armed groups where the armed groups are participating in the fight, but also there are parties to the negotiation brokered by the UN, which is a very interesting dynamic because uh, most of these, the UN got used to member states working together and negotiating, but then the UN had to sponsor non-state actors negotiating with states or sometimes among themselves. I go to our work currently. Currently, I lead the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. We, as Jack, started in 2012. We focus on promoting accountability, justice and accountability for Syrians through documenting what's happening, analyzing the documentation, and leading the justice discourse on Syria. So we do a lot of things under these categories. Documentation is the backbone of our work. We collect documentation from inside Syria, interviews with survivors, interviews with witnesses, um, we collect documentation from government buildings, and I have a picture of this. So this is a building of a government intelligence facility where the facility was abandoned by the government forces, and our team ended up inside and collected what we can collect from the documents. In the middle, you will see this is a tool for torture, unfortunately. This is where you tie people into this thing on the, on the wood. It's used for torture, but also it shows how the rebels treated those buildings when the fighters ended up inside those buildings, they're unfortunately busy with looting the buildings. Chairs, laptops, screens. We were busy taking the documents because the documents are valuable and important. And we did a good analysis of them. We went through the documents. We have half a million pages of the government intelligence archive. Not all of it is classified top secret, but a lot of it. We went through those documents, and we published a report two years ago called Walls Have Ears. We analyzed 5,000 documents from the top classified uh, papers. And this was never done in Syria. Like, you know about the intelligence, we hear about them, people experienced bad relations with them, but to read their own handwriting all over the documents, what they ordered, what they did not order, how they treated the, beha the behavior of the security agencies, how they treated the protesters, all was unique because now it's with hard evidence. It's written in their handwriting, in their documents, they signed on it, they have their names, and it's full of information. So a couple of, of reflections on the documents themselves, that everything in Syria is super centralized, that if you needed to open a falafel shop, you need an intelligence approval. If you needed to open a barber shop, you needed an intelligence approval. If you needed uh, to convert your religion, you needed intelligence approval. Everything. If you have a wedding party, you need intelligence approval. Whatever you have to do, you have to go through the intelligence. 
when we saw the documents, we've seen really patterns of surveillance of activists, monitoring journalists, tracking activism, even spying on some journalists, and they named them in the documents where it's blacked out, ordering shilling of hospitals, ordering basically. And they knew these documents could go somewhere, so the terms used on them are very broad, but in a way it's understood for the intelligence and the military. So we know suspects and terrorists in court are stationed in this area. We advise you to do the necessary. So do the necessary is the order that comes across most of the documents, which was never spelled out what's do the necessary. But what we do in our documentation, we also collected the videos appeared from the conflict. We have almost a million and a half videos all taken from YouTube. You go to those videos and see what happened in this incident, and you see what the necessary was done and how it was done. It was done by using lethal force against civilians usually, and linking those evidence together is very important for us. So we collect interviews, we collect documents, we collect videos, we collected ISIS documents. Same story, when ISIS was defeated, they left lots of documents behind them. We end up in, inside when we get those documents, and we have some of them in our custody. Some of them are showing clearly arrest orders with names, and some of them execution orders as well with names. And this becomes very important with the context that there's around 8,000 Syrians still missing in northeast Syria, arrested and kidnapped by ISIS over the couple of years ISIS governed northeast Syria. But then those people disappeared, melted. But now we're looking for them, and we have some evidence on the death of some of them, and we have some evidence that some of them were arrested, indeed, in certain areas in certain time, like this one. The second area for work is the analysis. I'm not going to get into much to the weeds of it. We designed a database called Bayanat. It's available in bayanat.org. It's an open source database. Only the software is open source, not our data. So the software could be used by other human rights groups at no cost to them. And we help quite a bit of groups, like accessing the software and downloading it and using it. Our data is encrypted and it's protected and it's not available. But what we do in, the, in Bayanat, we dump all the information we have, videos, documents, interviews, documents from other groups, etc., and we make linkages of them, make a bigger picture about every small incident we come across. So you will see in this example here, this gentleman appeared in a video being tortured by the military. We have the video, appeared on YouTube. A separate video appeared of his dead body being examined by his family with bruises and signs of torture, but the videos matched because the face are the same. We don't do facial recognition, but they match because it's similarity in location and type of violations and the date and all these information. So the database narrows that search for us and we can do human review and make sure these corresponds to each other. More, we have a document saying he was spraying bad things against the president and he should be arrested. So we have the arrest order, how they treated him, and the result. And this is a perfect case of how violations were, were committed. Part of the analysis we do, docu going through the videos, we processed around, analyzed around 375, maybe 400,000 videos from the, from the YouTube collection. Some of them were removed later by YouTube, but we preserved everything. So most of the videos from the conflict are, are with us. Part of the dilemma for Syrians as well is that they don't have a justice mechanism yet. There's no international court for Syria. There's no access to the International Criminal Court from the UN. So the only available justice mechanism for Syrians for today is uh, national prosecutions in Europe under what's so-called universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction, in very simple words, is the principle allowing a government or a court, like in Germany, to have active jurisdiction and review a case about a crime committed by Syrians in Syria, even that does not relate in Germany. One of the crime is war crime and crime against humanity. And for that, we have relations with most of the active governments to, to have act active jurisdictions over some crimes. We work with the war crimes units in Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, France, among other countries, but also we work with the UN mechanisms, the Commission of Inquiry, and the international investigative mechanism. So the idea is sharing evidence with the prosecutors and getting requests from them and helping them submit cases. As we've all seen in the media, lots of Syrian refugees ended up in Europe. And a lot of them civilians, a lot of them survivors of the violence and conflict, but there's some were fighters, either on the government side or on the rebel side, and they were identified 
either by their peers or neighbors or sometimes by media or they appear in a YouTube video and then we recognize them. This is the same person here. Some of them are facing charges in different countries. The big case is currently in Germany, in Koblenz, Germany, uh, against a former Syrian official who used to be a head of intelligence branch in, in Damascus. And he was, was recognized by the federal police and they faced a case against him. I'll go quickly to missing persons. Um, this is a new area of our work. It's been there for a year and a half only. We're still learning in it. It's the work for missing persons. And this is what I highlighted about ISIS. When ISIS left Syria, was defeated, they left a legacy of around 8,000 missings. So those people kind of melted, like they do not appear anywhere. A lot of prisoners were freed by the Kurdish and the US forces, but a lot did not show up in any video or any documentation by any, any person. What started showing up, unfortunately, is mass graves full of dead bodies were executed by ISIS. And the mass graves are not all exclusive to ISIS. Some of them are informal burials done by the locals. Some of them burials of people died, but not on ISIS hand during the bombardment campaign against ISIS. But we've been trying to do, there's a, a local team of forensic they call themselves the uh, FRT, the first response team. What they've been trying to do is to excavate the mass graves left behind with, with ISIS. We've been doing this with them. We've been doing forensic training, basically provide them the knowledge on how to properly excavate a grave, how to collect the evidence, how to preserve it, what to do with it. Unfortunately, we do not have laboratory, basically services in Syria and genetic analysis because it's expensive, it, we do not have the scientific knowledge for it in the country, and there's no infrastructure for it. But the current training is focused on forensic anthropology, basic archaeology, and genetic and identification work. Basically collecting a sample, but without sending it to a lab, more or less. Um, but one, one of the important things about the missing search for the missing is it's also search for a truth, not only for the single individuals who disappeared. So what we do is contact, conducting and contextual analysis, and this is important part of what we do. So the picture on the left is ISIS detention center, one of their detention centers. What we're trying to do is to film the walls from inside, and because most of the prisoners would engrave their names on the wall of a detention facility someday, somebody will read it, and we're trying to collect those names. On the other side is the map of the city of Raqqa. The yellow dots are the points of graves, where the graves were discovered around the city. We're trying to map the graves to the sites of, uh, of detention facilities and try to narrow down the search for those missing. So if X was held in this detention facility, likely to be buried on the grave next to it, not the one across the city. So this is narrowing a little bit for our search is not the final determination of identification clearly, but so you don't run the sample across all the bodies you have, you run it across a smaller set if you wanna do identification or genetics. The next picture is gonna be very graphic, so if you do wanna look at it, it's blurred a little bit, but it's an important piece of the evidence and it's important we keep it in context. I'll flip to it for, for a second only. These are all dead bodies thrown under torture in, in a scene here. In 2013, a military photographer defected from the Syrian military and he ran out of the country with his memory card showing all these pictures. So his job was full-time military photographer to take pictures of the bodies died under torture inside Syrian government custody. And he did a lot of those for a year and a half to two years till he reached a limit he cannot do this anymore. Start seeing people he knew, start seeing friends and neighbors, and he's unable to do it. And he ran away with his computer guy his coworker, they got copied the desks and left the country. 27,000 pictures of around 7,000 bodies tortured, or around 6,800 bodies died under torture. The, the pictures unfortunately made it to the internet. We fought really hard against that, but it was copied by different groups and eventually a group leaked it online. Because we found it really difficult for families who are looking for their loved ones who are detained to go sniff through the pictures of dead bodies all over the days and nights, thousands of them, so they can potentially match a picture to say, oh, this used to be my son, or this is my partner, etc. 
nevertheless, now what we're trying to do is to analyze those pictures. And the government was, because they're so centralized, they wrote on every forehead, everybody, the number of the body and the number of the branch where it came from, what intelligence branch actually had that body, and some basic information like dates, etc. So those pictures, analysis of those pictures is really important to show how the government had a centralized decision and systematic program of executing those people in prison. We're not really dying of bad conditions only or by coincidence or a mistake here or there. This is really centralized systematic program. The pictures appeared in Germany during the trial for the former officer. Apparently the branch of intelligence he was heading had pictures appeared on those evidence, and lots of pictures appear with the number 215, which is the number of his branch, or sorry, 251. And um, basically, that was also another evidence that there were torture committed in his branch that resulted in death of people. He's being charged of killing and death. So I'll skip the picture quickly. I'll, sp I'll speak for a couple of minutes about challenges, but then very happy to, to discuss further. Uh, we have a couple of challenges here. Uh, clearly, the security and safety of our team and access on area of areas that under the Syrian government control. All other areas are, are dangerous, don't get me wrong, but the Syrian government will execute people immediately. Similar with when ISIS took over the third of Syria on the northeast, we had to evacuate our team quickly because we do not want to put up with any risk of somebody getting kidnapped. We ended up losing some data. Some of our team buried the hard drives they had, and they had to leave the country, because this is the way we do it. We train people on physical security and digital security, and we prioritize their safety. So the access, the movement, security, how to access the areas controlled by the Syrian government is really important, and it's very challenging. I'll skip the second one. I'll get back to it in a second. But I'll go to the advocacy versus accountability. And this is really important in the Syrian civil society context, but also it's important to highlight a lot of the Syrian colleagues and organizations doing work on Syria, they're concerned with the advocacy part of the work. So they issue statements, they collect some information, but they quickly accuse Russia of bombing this hospital or accuse the Syrian government of doing this or accuse the US forces of doing that without collecting evidence further and assigning blame from day one without going to any kind of justice mechanism. That had its own negative impact on these groups when they start sharing evidence later with courts or with UN mechanisms like, oh, our evidence is impartial, except you accuse that party of committing the crime next morning before you conducted a thorough investigation or research. Because we are a accountability and justice concerned organization, we do not do advocacy. We do not issue statements. We do not name and shame. We do not call people names. We do not do this business. Sometimes we got into heat debates with some Syrian constituents. You never accuse the Syrian government. Like, yeah, we have a lot of evidence. Why do you want to accuse them? Let's take it to court. The court will charge them. We're not going to accuse them verbally online because it, it's worthless. It has no value except some, some advocacy techniques. Some of the big challenges working with Syrians is that we do not have an accountability mechanism for Syria. Uh, Syrians tried, the international community tried to refer the case of Syria to the International Criminal Court in 2014. So in May 2014, Syria is not a member state to the Rome Statute, to the International Criminal Court Agreement. So the only way the court can participate or, or practice jurisdiction is through a UN Security Council resolution, which was vetoed by Russia and China together. And since then, there's no further attempts were made, wisely so, because Russia is going to veto them again. So this, this is what's happening. And now going to establish a mechanism for Syria, either a Security Council resolution referring us to the ICC, or a Security Council resolution establishing a special court for Syria, which equally will be vetoed by Russia. And Russia vetoed the referral to the ICC even before they participated militarily in Syria. So now they are party to the conflict. They conducted a lot of the airstrikes there. They committed lots of the war crimes by the Air Force, more likely to veto any potential mechanism. So that put us in a bit of a difficult position because the UN ended up trying to go around the Russian veto. They went through the General Assembly, not the Security Council, established what's so-called the Triple IM, Independent International Impartial Mechanism, to investigate, which is, have been acting as a prosecutor office for a court that never existed yet. They collect evidence, build dossiers, but we don't know where to go. It's like still up to be, to be seen. 
And this is very challenging discourse with the Syrians because you have to explain some international legal principles, but also explain some political issues about the Security Council. But we get this pressure a lot about the demands, um, why there is a tribunal or no for Syria, why there is no court for Syria, why Al-Hariri assassination get a court, why Syria is, oh, we don't think we deserve a court? If we were millionaires like Al-Hariri, would have gotten a court? But the, the reason is clearly is not that. We have some issue with the documentation classification itself, whether it could be used as an evidence or not. And this is a murky area because none of the Syrian organization, including us, has done this before, documenting evidence to go to tribunals or to courts. So we learned by doing. We had lots of legal expertise on the team. But also, a lot of groups got stuck between are what, what we're doing is documentation, is going to be used as a context, or it's actually hard evidence going to be admissible in a court of law is going to be used there, and this is what's going to be the base of a, a case there. And unfortunately, lots of government jump, governments jumped into that field, and there's lots of competition between international groups who are non-Syrians who try to compete with Syrians what they're doing. And the key word was like, oh, what you're doing is not an evidence, it's just documentation. We have the evidence because we're international experts. That narrative got flipped a lot and, and debunked with Syrian groups being the source of evidence on those trials in Germany, in Netherlands, in Sweden, and sharing those information with courts, and asking the Syrian witnesses and experts to come and testify in court, not only the international expert, or sometimes not even international expert. And so I don't want to make a rude comment, but usually uh, we have uh, what we call them the justice entrepreneurs, like sometimes uh, retired international law practitioners or retired former tribunals staff looking for opportunities for themselves. And unfortunately, that was a little bit destructive in the work in Syria because it discouraged lots of the groups. Like, hey, if our work is not going to be taken seriously, why would you do it? We risk our life to do it. So what's the point of doing it? Final point is part of the challenges is speaking on behalf of the others or speaking for the others. It's a very, very, very challenging task. Although I come from a family who clearly was on the right side, we spoke up against the government years before anybody protested, ended up physically in prison a couple of times with my family. My father and my brother also ended up in prison for five, five and a half years. We still get the challenge between the people inside the country looking at themselves as more legitimate to speak and they have more rights to demand things more than the people who are outside the country. And even if you're speaking for us or on our behalf, we have more right and we're more entitled than you to speak and to demand things. And that created some hierarchy of, of victims first to start with, but also hierarchy of legitimacy. Who's legit enough to speak about these topics and who can speak on behalf of the people and who can demand more or who can cannot demand. Sometimes those demands are really great and we support them and we work with them. Sometimes it's demands we cannot really take in consideration. Like we want to kill everybody else who tried to kill us. Oh, they displace us. Let's go to their towns and displace them. That narrative nobody can support clearly, but it created the dynamic and the diversion between people inside the country and people outside the country kind of labeling the outside, like, hey, you survived, and we're here, we're paying a heavy price, so we're more entitled to speak than you, and we're not going to let you speak on our behalf. Also, this is part, part of the challenges. One thing I did not put here in the slide was the rise of the non-state actors, which is really important. I can comment on it in the discussions if you want. But thank you very much for, for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. but then please uh, raise your hand in the audience if you have a question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Um, I'll start off um, with some questions, but please raise your hand if you have a question from the audience, and I will also monitor the Q&A. So I think we could start there with the uh, state actors and the non-state actors in thinking of state actors, not just the Syrian government, but also the US, Russia, 
and how you uh, work within a very complicated situation and balance. Sure. So in, in, at the beginning of the conflict when Sy the Syrian government was the major player in the country, usually states are the biggest protectors of human rights because that's their job. That's what they do. And they, they have the resources and they have the mandate to do that. But they quickly turn to be the biggest violator of human rights because they have the resources and they have the military and they have the army and they have everything, the, the weapons. And that's what happened exactly in Syria. The government started shooting at protesters, started depriving them with, of medical care. Even if you're injured, you cannot go to a hospital because you will be arrested or likely to be executed in the, in the hospital. But then quickly the armed groups, the opposition, picked up arms and started defending themselves. And that's where the country dragged more to a civil war. This is when the UN in 2012 said, OK, IHL apply now, international humanitarian law, because we are in a set of uh, armed conflict, no longer international human rights applicable only. And what the international humanitarian law and principles try to do is to protect civilians, have them out of the question. Like, you cannot shoot civilians. You cannot torture civilians. You cannot execute civilians, protect them. But that, that was a deliberate campaign. And as we've seen in our documents, the government did not do that by mistake. As the Caesar photos showed, that was not a one or two mistake. That's a very systematic effort. Now, the opposition groups start doing the same. They start torturing people. They start arresting and disappearing people. They participated in lots of atrocities. They committed lots of crimes, so on, so forth, so on. And then the list gets longer because other member states start joining the conflict. Iran joined through militias and military advisors, and through militias from Iraq, from Lebanon, and from, even from Afghanistan. And then Russia was invited officially to participate through their air force in 2015. So they started in September 2015. And then you have like a crazy scene like the map where everybody fighting everybody, and the civilians are paying the price. One comment, I'll go back more to the non-state non actors part, but to put things more in context um, is how civilians were treated in those set settings. The Syrian government is controlling X town, and this town still with the Syrian government control. The rebels take over the town, and they collectively punish the locals. Because like, hey, you're welcoming the Syrian government troops, and now either destroy their properties, sometimes loot the properties, shoot some people, arrest some people, with, of course, vague accusations, like, oh, you're former informants for the government, or you worked with the military, or you were supportive of Assad regime. The same town later got back liberated or taken over by the Syrian military to, to be punished by the Syrian government, because, like, hey, you were welcoming those terrorists, and you welcomed them in. So, like, the same thing, displacement, sometimes the, the key thing. Uh, looting and destroying their properties. But then later, a group like ISIS show up and take over the city and punish the locals because they were working with the non-Muslims and with, with all those uh, non-Muslims or not non-Sunni Muslims, let's say. And then the Syrian government comes back to take the town and so forth. So, on. so the civilians really suffered a lot in the hands of everybody. And every scenario where the de facto power showed up in a town or a city, the locals paid the price no matter what they did before. Like, clearly, there's no way to assign blame or attribute, like, hey, they were welcoming them or they were scared for their life. They let them stay. This is what happened. So the non-state actors become more complicated. When you look at the numbers of the armed groups in Syria, hundreds of armed groups. And you look at the countries who are supporting them, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. So the three countries doesn't have amazing track record of human rights, and some of them were fueling more extremist narrative and supporting and funding more extremist version of those groups just because that's, that's the way they do it. Uh, the UN got in the middle a lot uh, with their multi-failures, but their biggest failure, we'll talk about it maybe in the, in the questions about the targeting hospitals, but the UN had to sponsor a non-state actor negotiation. The head of the negotiation from the opposition side was the head of a militia and he became the chief negotiator for the opposition, negotiating with the Syrian state. So that scenario itself is, is difficult. And um, the UN did not even treat the conflict in Syria, in my opinion, they did not treat it well. They did not think it through. They just looked at their textbook, and they followed the same practice they do elsewhere. Um, for example, in the international humanitarian law, if you two countries fighting and you arrest soldiers from both sides, those are prisoners of war. You cannot 
kill them or torture them or even prosecute them. You should treat them well. You should release them at the end of hostilities. That doesn't apply to the militias or to the non-state actors. When they're arrested, the state could prosecute them, actually, for picking up arms or for fighting against the state. So the non-state actors did not have any incentive, really, to respect IHL because the state was not doing it. Why we would we do it? And the UN got in the middle a lot with training and capacity, and like none of that worked. It complicated the scene. And one thing I still, when I look at Syria, that I, I, it comes to my eyes immediately that what, all the horror happened on the hands of the Syrian government was so centralized and was deliberate and systematic. An equal horror happened from the opposition, not to the same numbers, of course, but the same brutality. That was not systematic, was very decentralized. Every group behaved at their own, but they ended up doing the same thing, basically with the same results. Very interesting how the, the two are doing the same things, but facing very different consequences. And somewhat along these lines, uh, we have an anonymous attendee who um, has asked if you could talk a little bit more um, about the difference between documentation and evidence, how you extract evidence from documents. And sure, I mean, honestly, I don't want to turn it to a legal discussion, but in, in our mind, there's nothing difference between documentation and evidence, except what the, what the prosecutors admit as an evidence in the case is called evidence. What you collected before, it's, you can call it documentation, you can call it evidence. That was played a lot against lots of, of Syrian groups, civil society, small groups doing work. And even to a more extreme version of that, like all, all the digital evidence is not going to be accepted. But then apparently all the courts in Europe are accepting the Caesar photos, which is only digital version of it accessible all of them accepting the videos from YouTube and from social media, which is all digital only. Um, so it did not take a lot of effort from prosecutors to be, um, to be agile about it and be responsive to the nature of documentation today, which is mostly digital documentation. And uh, everybody had a phone, and they managed to take a picture or a video sometime. Uh, but turning it like either it's written documents and dossiers or the prosecutor will deny it and it's not called evidence, um, created some, some challenges imposed more by international experts, honestly, more than by the Syrians themselves. Uh, nobody had the, like, the final answer still. The cases start getting to courts and courts start accepting those general documentation and context documentation and interviews as evidence and admitting them and using them. And that was a good validation of the work a lot of the Syrian civil society did. And honestly, they put their life to do this work. They put their life online to do, to do it. So it, it was very important to see that work being recognized in cases in Germany and Sweden and Netherlands, elsewhere. Yeah, and was the initial hesitation or concern because it's alterable? Uh, what? It's mixed things. Like, there's no big history for international tribunals to work with digital evidence. So all the tribunals prior work on ICTY, International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, for former Yugoslavia, or ICTR worked on cases where like UN courts like piles of papers and you have to translate everything to the UN languages and you have to do all the traditional work. And like the practitioners who worked on those cases they did not experience like digital evidence being used in, in those settings. And they were making the wrong, let's say if you want to put it in a good faith, at least the wrong advice to the Syrians that you cannot use this because it's not going to be helpful. Nevertheless, people continue to, to document. Now, one thing important to highlight is the videos appeared on YouTube are not documentation by dedicated human rights groups. It's the, the documentation by the public, civilians. Like everybody has a phone, snap a video and upload it online. And then groups like us download everything, centralize it, link it to each other, and link it to other documents and to other witnesses, and try to make a good use of, of those videos. We have one excellent example, but I did not show it in the, in the slide. One document from the government says, we suspect terrorists are stationed in this hospital. So we suggest we shell the hospital with artilleries or with helicopters. And the general says one word, agreed. But then we had several YouTube videos appeared from different people some from outside the hospital showing how the, the, the mortar shelling is hitting the hospital, and some from inside the hospital by some medical staff basically showing there's only civilians here and they're throwing rockets on us. So see what's happening. So linking these together, that 
the important part as well about it that these were never coordinated. The documents were extracted years before the videos were shot, and we have a good tracking of like the chain of custody, who, who filmed where and who, who documented where. Uh, so that shows how the linkage of all this information is important, be it partially digital or fully digital, did not really impact the work at all. One of the things you've talked about doing is documenting inside detention facilities the names that mm -hmm. those who were being held would write their names. How does that count in terms of evidence or documentation? The, the whole missing persons work is, is being conducted with the eye on identification of those missing people, especially the people in the graves, but uh, also the truth about what happened in those conflict, on those executions. Now, one principle, and that very, very first, first principle of searching for the missing is that assumption of everybody is alive till we have evidence otherwise. So we treat every single case of those people as people still living, and we're looking with the, for them with their family. And so f finding a name of some uh, about a, a person on the wall could be mismatch, could be the same name, could be wrong, could be somebody engraved it about his friend who he saw in a different place, could, could mean anything. Mm -hmm. So it's not taken as is, as, oh, this is the evidence your son was in this detention facility. And, and the, even the names that appeared in the execution orders of ISIS, we treat them with suspicion that we find more, more evidence and more leads that that execution happened. They could have sent somebody to execution, but then U.S. forces arrived on time or, or hit the place with a, with a missile, and then they never carried that, that execution. So we're very careful, especially we don't have the genetics analysis. We don't have laboratory services. You cannot really do the 100% DNA test for lost reasons. Um, like, you, you cannot really give information about. But even that that's a very difficult area i don't want to go to the details of it unless somebody asks about it but in short it's very complicated to do the identification with no authorities in place and uh, because assume like okay you got a laboratory services by x country did the service for you and like you know this x person is dead who's going to issue a death certificate to that person there's no state to do so and the non-state actor the kurdish forces who's running the show in the northeast syria is not recognized by the state. They're not recognized by the UN. Like you look at the Kurdish government in Iraq, they are recognized by the federal by the federal state and by the constitution of Iraq, but that's not the case in Syria. So, and and this is another murky area because lots of wealth could be inherited by somebody if they bring a death certificate of their father. But is that death certificate correct or legitimate? That's another question. So it gets into a lot, a lot, a lot complicated areas that the country and the people are not prepared to deal with yet because we don't have any mechanisms to, to work on. Like, who's the authority who's going to issue a death certificate? Who's the authority who's going to, like, and, and lots of cases, like, could result if a woman results her single again or a widow after her, her husband uh, died and, like, oh, she gets married, but then the husband is alive. Like, you could go into a lot of cases where any wrong identification could cause a lot of problems for the families more than help them, actually. Mm -hmm. And we've seen families who show up on some of the grave sites where the digging was happening, the excavation, and they try to identify somebody through the shirt, the color of the shirt of the body. It was like, oh, that used to be my son's shirt. And, like, and sometimes, unfortunately, the families were armed, and they want to take the body by force. But you don't know who swapped clothing with whom inside the prison and who was dressed with the prisoner's dress code or not. Like, it's impossible, really to identify based on just basic leads. And that's why we treat everything very carefully. We don't end up with the area where we do wrong identification or we result in, in more, more problems than help. I think a microphone coming your way. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering why um, a abusing governments or groups would document abuses so closely. You mentioned yep. the photographer that worked for the military, even identification numbers. I mean, is it just by nature of the fact that they feel justified in what they're doing? Um, I mean, I, I sense that because that photographer uh, defected and left the country in order to release the photos indicates that 
they didn't want those photos to get out. Um, but I mean, why, why not have a system that covers it up more or what's the motivation for them being so organized in um, categorizing something that they must know to be wrong or could be used against them later? Same practice all over the place, like from the Nazis all the way till, till the American forces in Abu Ghraib torturing people and filming them being tortured, and then it's leaked by somebody to the media, and then it's in public. Not necessarily, it's like probably psychologists will, will address this differently about like the torturers and the dynamic with, with, the, with their victims, but um, I relate this to the bureaucracy and centralized decisions in Syria because everything is with, in the hands with the intelligence and they have to record everything they're doing, including the death of those people. Although they do not care about them, like whether the family knew or the person is dead or not, or they issue them a death certificate, they, they cannot care less. The point is it's part of the bureaucracy of like who died in this branch should be documented and they keep those records, and then a defector gets lucky to, to be able to leave the country with, with the photos and the world see what's, what's happening. It's uh, same with the Nazis when uh, Benjamin Francis went to for the prosecution and the Nazis in the Nuremberg. Uh, somebody told him, like, hey, I was waiting for you, come here. And apparently the person was, but that kind of was well-intended person was keeping the identification of all those who were executed in a safe place and then handed the evidence to to, to the prosecutors, and uh, but the story, the same story repeated. Torturers tend to to film themselves. Now we see that very clearly with the opposition groups as well, with the, with the rebels. They commit really terrible things, and then they film themselves, and sometimes they show their faces in it. And some of those videos led to some of those people in prison in in Europe. The very first case against a Syrian. Uh, perpetrator was in Sweden in 2014. I served as, a, as an expert in the case. And the case came from Facebook. The guy posted his own picture, his own video torturing somebody handcuffed to a chair. And of course he deleted it like an hour later, but the prosecutor took note of it and asked Facebook to, re to reinstate the video and they shared it with them. And I was asked to provide analysis and context about it. Like some people are like proud about what they're doing. Some people want to show what they're doing. Sometimes all above, like it's just some people are stupid and, and like this guy had their own video. And, and this is a point we see a lot among the refugee populations in, in Europe. We're starting a new project. We just started three weeks ago, uh, basically highlighting the uh, s supporting uh, prosecutors in Germany, Sweden, and Netherlands and prosecuting potential perpetrators who are resident in Europe now, that who committed violations in Syria. Um, and a lot of the evidence is actually their own evidence. It's in their own cell phones. They shared it with their friends or they show it to somebody in the camp. So we get a witness saying this guy has on his phone pictures showing or videos showing him torturing others and then like leading an investigation with the police and like confiscating those or accessing them from remote. I don't know how they do it, but eventually they get the materials and prosecute them, but yeah, it is something happens all the time. Yeah, we have two people, yeah. We can take more than questions if you're fine with that, yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about the interview portion of the data collection. So I know that you kind of mentioned you'll interview survivors or, or victims, but I'm wondering how you know, it seems like what you do is very dangerous. Um, it is. It's a lot of running. Um, how do you, you know, conduct those interviews with people under such duress and then kind of figure out how to not put them in like unsafe positions like when you're, when you're doing this research? Sure. Or do you, I guess, is the, is the question. Do you wanna take the other question or, yeah? My name is Karima Benoun, and I'm a visiting professor at the law school here, and I teach human rights, and I wanted to say this was a very inspiring talk, uh, and your work is an incredible model. And there's so many questions that I would like to ask you, but I, I just will start with one, not to take up too much time. I very much appreciated the ethical and thoughtful way that you handled the image that you showed of the people who had died from torture, and I was wondering 
what your ethical process is as an organization in deciding how to use images. And I think you're absolutely right that at some level it is very important to show the reality of what we're talking about, and yet if we go too far, we're participating in normalizing violence and, and really not respecting uh, the privacy of victims and indeed the dignity of their families. And so I'm wondering the degree to which it may be impossible, but do you try to get consent of families where that's uh, possible? How do you think through that? And do you think we need in the field of human rights to really develop some standards. I'm thinking about the controversy over Amnesty International's use of an image of a Somali boy who had been burned by Canadian peacekeepers some years ago. And that was a little bit different because in fact I think the image ended up being used in fundraising which clearly raises entirely different More issues. But yeah. Nonetheless, I, th I think it is a big difficulty in the field. And just if I can sneak in one more question, what do you think we should be teaching our students in terms of documentation skills? Because I often fear that maybe in the field of human rights, we're actually not spending enough time uh, doing that, and your guidance would be very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any? Uh, we do. So we have um, two related questions. Sure. Um, from Eshkra, who is a PhD student who is in yep, class today, yep. and also uh, Caitlin, who was also in class today. She's a law student. Um, so they're both asking questions about uh, universal jurisdiction as an accountability um, mechanism. How viable do you see it, um, particularly in moving sure. Syria forward? And um, uh, how in other countries with univ how universal jurisdiction has been used sure. effectively. Sure. I'll start with the interviews. It's very challenging. It's very difficult. Um, we have a lot of, and this touches to the ethics as well and the consent part. We're super detailed in our consent form and explaining to the people what they're signing up for and explaining to them that they can withdraw the consent even after we finish the work and we spend the time with it. And, um, but also managing their expectations and being super honest to them about that. You're not getting a letter from us that help you with the UN asylum case, or you're not getting a letter helping you. Because there's so much expectations built in the mind of those people. Um, but we're very clear about it. And unfortunately, lots of survivors got burned by those promises, but then later realized they were lied to by some local groups here and there um, to do the interviews. So we go through. We don't interview people if, unless it's a safe space for them, a safe place physically and even mentally. Um, we have a dual referral system which is linking all the uh, psychological support uh, network available in the area or even remote if not nothing available and make sure they're prepared to receive a case, a new case if there is need for the witness or survivor to be referred to a service provider. And vice versa, the service providers refer to us cases to be documented. So we have a good integration of that, of that system. And um, collecting the information is, it's not easy because as I mentioned, sometimes um, we have a scorecard where we, we review and uh, evaluate every interview. And part of it is writing the impression as an interviewer, my impression of X, um, she was exaggerating. She was not able to answer any questions. She was giving general information. Clearly, she did not witness those, but she knew about people witnessed them, and she was repeating stories. And, and of course, you cannot judge people, but you can ask them some questions to challenge the narrative a little bit. And that of itself is an art, because sometimes you challenge them a little bit too far, and they get angry, and they don't want to respond. Like, hey, you undermine my, my story, you don't believe my narrative, and so forth, so on. So it's very, very difficult. So it, it took a lot of time from our team to develop more skills and build trust and confidence with the local community. If we're unable to do the interview, we're not gonna do it. That's the main thing. And we do not interview children for that purpose because we, we do not have enough skills to do it. Like, it's difficult, we need custodial uh, consent or parents, so sometimes they will volunteer their children even without really understanding how much this will uh, have trauma effect on the, on, the, on the child. So we decided not to do it, for example. And that goes to the ethical side. We do not publish data. We do not use, we do not put the data in public. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the videos appeared online were shot without the consent of anybody who appeared on them. And that's a dilemma Google is actually 
in the middle of it because if somebody reported this video, say, hey, I appear in this video and you have to delete it. I don't want to be in this video. But that person is not the owner of the video and the owner has a sole copyright of it because he filmed it in his camera. Like how they're going to work on these cases. It's very difficult, but we try not to publish data. We do not share names. Um, even our data management protocols, when we receive the interviews from the, from the ground, we do not receive the names. We receive the interviews only with the details, and then we try to receive the names only physically later or encrypted in a different method, and then we map them out to the interviews in our database. Just trying to reduce any risk of somebody getting compromised or their safety is, is put at risk. The Caesar photos were, were very unique in their nature and the level of evidence they pr provide, especially the writing of the government officials on the head of every dead body, the number of the body and the date and the number of the branch. Yet we were not happy with the way they were dumped online because this could have been organized in a different way and try to collect information from the public, ask them to submit pictures of their loved ones, use some technology to do some matching without throwing them publicly. At least 150 families were able to identify their loved ones from the pictures. And guess what? They did not find them in the first or second batch. They had to go through thousands of images of dead bodies, tortured bodies, to find their loved ones. Of course, if you couldn't find your loved one among these pictures, where your mind is now, like this is what happens in prison, and we know about it. Like it is, it is like this. So it's very, very difficult, and, and that's part of the documentation skills. I don't think you need documentation skills per se um, to be trained in. And we do trainings in our website; it's available, and we we make it in Arabic available because there's a lot of wealth of English content training. But we developed a lot in Arabic; it's available online for free. The point is. We had lots of issues with, uh, no offense, with academics, uh, because every time we asked for legal support, we received 50 pages uh, memo on how to document torture. Here's the Istanbul Protocol, and here's the, the Convention Against Torture, and here's two additional protocols. That's not what we're trying to do. We try to operationalize things in ways that could help the average person on the street conduct enough good enough information that could be used and become of value. And that's why our, our training course online is very, very, very practical. It goes through the examples, regardless of the definitions of torture or what IHL says about this or that. It's very practical on what to collect, how to collect it, try to measure, try to get the background, especially in targeting of civilian areas. Usually the government says there is a military base next to them or there's something. So try to get more wider shots of showing there's actually no legitimate target in the uh, uh, close area. So all, all this, we learned more by doing more than the, the legal like notes and, and narratives we had, uh, which is, of course, it is the base of all this work. The database is designed to create the relations and the definitions based on IHL definitions, international humanitarian law. But the understanding of the analysts themselves, we have nine full-time data analysts who go through the videos and the documents and do this work. And they're really good at it, but good at it from the perspective, not, they're not lawyers, none of them actually with a law background, maybe one or not, not even one. But the understanding the context, understanding the practice, and understanding the utility of this analysis later is the key of it, maybe. Uh, universal jurisdiction is a very important principle. It's unfortunate we don't have a lot of it in the US applicable here. We have some universal jurisdiction in the US related to trafficking in person, which is very, very recent. Um, and there is related to torture if you are citizens involved abroad, but, but it's not very, very broad. In fact, universal jurisdiction was utilized a lot by the Palestinians in Europe and against Israeli officials. And there's a couple of cases where Israeli officials landed in, in London, in Heathrow Airport, and they were told, do not get off the flight. It might be an arrest warrant waiting for you, and the foreign ministry cannot do anything for you. If there's an, and they went back. I think Tsebi Livni was one of the, those people. But also, some human rights groups tried to do it against Donald Rumsfeld, and that's the only year Rumsfeld skipped the NATO summit in 2006 because he thought he could be prosecuted in, in, in Belgium under the principle of universal jurisdiction. So what did the US do? Pressured all the European governments to trim their universal jurisdiction principles and limit the use of them so they're no longer reaching to the US or their allies. 
nevertheless, the principle is back and it's reintroduced in a couple of countries with some expansions in some places. And there's different versions of it. I can go to the legalities. Uh, in some countries like Netherlands, it's called extraterritorial jurisdiction, which means has to be something about Netherlands, a citizen, uh, either a perpetrator or a victim or a Netherlands assets or company or interest, even if it's abroad, but Netherlands needs to be a link. In Germany, it has not to be. Like a crime and a third party committed by two parties against each other, even if the perpetrator or the victim neither is on the German soil, they do have jurisdiction. The problem with the universal jurisdiction is two things. One, because it's a national court, they cannot put heads of state on trial. So there's a limitation there. They cannot prosecute heads of states and or ministers. So they're going to end up with anybody below that. And that's important for itself. But if we talk about justice, what the justice, what justice means in the eyes of Syrians, it's like Assad needs to be prosecuted, or at least some of his top leadership, not a security agency leader here or there only. And the other problem with universal jurisdiction is the enforcement mechanism, because um, recently, like two years ago, Germany issued three arrest warrants against three chiefs of the intelligence agencies in Syria. And that was a big deal, really, because those people, there's cases by survivors were put together, lots of people witnessed in those cases, and the prosecutors issued arrest warrants, and it went to the Interpol, red warrants. However, Syria is not going to extradite those, simply, and they do not travel to country who could extradite them. They are in the EU travel ban, clearly, and the US travel ban. So they go to Russia or to Iran, who's not going to turn them, and they're not going to voluntarily go turn themselves in. So what's the value of those arrest warrants? And this is a big discussion we have among the Syrian civil society, actually. Is the universal jurisdiction an advocacy tool, or it's actually a justice mechanism we could rely on. In, in our assessment, it's an important justice mechanism for now because we don't have other alternatives, but it's very limited in scope and it's not sufficient to say justice has been accomplished through universal jurisdiction. So this is some of the limitation we've seen in some of those cases. Hope that, that addresses the UJ things. That's, I think it's, it's, not, it's not the way forward in justice for Syria. Please. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks, Mohammed. Um, does SJAC think about the possibility of accountability by a future Syrian government, or is that just considered so uh, unlikely? Um, I mean, things can change in surprising ways in, in, in the course of uh, governments under siege. So is that something that's part of your calculus at all? Honestly, we don't think it's going to be a viable option because we don't, we don't anticipate that change to happen. But of course, if the change is meaningful enough, there is a good representative government in the country that they're going to do a good job in the prosecution, building cases, being fair in the trials, and uphold the international norms for fair trials and allow people to defend themselves. By all means, why not? But we look at Syria, we look at our neighbors in Iraq and our neighbors in Lebanon. Lebanon had a blanket amnesty after the civil war, after 15 years of fighting. Everybody went home free with no question asked. Iraq had a tribunal for Saddam Hussein, had all the problems in the world you could pack in a tribunal. It had a death penalty, so the UN and the EU pulled out from it, it was funded by the US and the Saudis and the Kuwaitis alone. Uh, it had lots of issues with the due processes and the fair trial. It has lots of criticism to the, to the tribunal. So a tribunal did not solve the issue in Iraq, and an amnesty did not solve the issue in Lebanon. Lebanon was left with a big legacy of almost 100,000 missings still from the civil war. And most of the militias and the war, uh, the war leaders or lords became members of parliament and ministers in Lebanon. And still the family suffering. Uh, so I, the preferred recipe, if I want to put it this way, is a holistic transitional justice mechanism, not only criminal accountability. Because even if you have the best justice sector in Syria five years uh, forward, you can only prosecute so many people, and the number of, of perpetrators is just massive. It's huge. You cannot put all those people in prison. You cannot prosecute them. You cannot secure them. You cannot feed them in prison. You don't want to be liable for their safety. 
half of the nation will turn to be enemies of the justice mechanism because you're, in, you're imprisoning their loved ones simply. They don't care whether they perpetrated the crimes or not. So this needs to be a system where a certain level of criminal prosecution is carried on and that for the purpose of justice and for the principle of justice and accountability and for sending the right messages to everybody that this type of behavior is going to be punished, but also putting other systems in place like truth-telling mechanism in, in Syria. It's very, very important because every party has their version of the truth in Syria today. Uh, there's like 20 truths in Syria floating around. The government say what happened staged by terrorists. The opposition say the government only used violence. Uh, lots of people say ISIS was staged by outside intelligence with, with help from outside. So without solid documentation, you will not be able to consolidate a good version of the truth, and that's what we try to do. We have documentation from all sides on all sides, let's say. Another element we spoke about in the, in the class was institutional reform. If you want to ensure this is not going to happen again, so we have to do some reform, and at least the security agencies, the uh, justice sector, and areas where, or, or agencies or departments were central to the violations. And the U.S. did it in Iraq. It's called debathification. So anybody who related to al-Ba'ath party was sent home. So the U.S. fired the cabinet, fired the military, and everybody went home. And that worked really bad because those guys ended up being enemies of the state, ended up with the militias picking up arms against the country or against the U.S. forces there. And also the country collapsed because nobody went to school next morning because schools are not open. Everybody in the school's system, the dean of the law school in Baghdad University was a Ba'athi because he was forced to, not because he was a bad guy or Saddam Hussein. So like, the country closed because there's no bureaucratic body to carry the, 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 the cabinet and the government. So doing, doing all this work is going to take a long time, a lot of resources. And one thing, sorry, this is taking a long time, long answer, but uh, Usually reparation programs are ignored in those settings because they need a lot of resources, which is usually not available. Syria needs estimate of $400 billion for reconstruction, which is not available either. So when you have some money, well, how are you going to deal with this? And uh, what's your priority? And even setting an, a tribunal from outside, ICTR and ICTY cost $2 billion each to put a handful of people behind bars. So if you, if you look, talk to the Syrian refugees today in Lebanon or Jordan or, or elsewhere, tell them, okay, we're going to spend $2 billion in the guy who destroyed the country and made you refugees, and you're going to continue to be in your tent for the next five years. Or you could get some of that money and reestablish your life and go back and send your children back to school. People have different priorities, depends on their context, and not everybody will prioritize criminal accountability. And this is something we come to realize more and more when we see Syrians out of Syria. A lot of the survivors denied to testify on the cases in Europe because they moved on. They don't want to open that wound again, and they don't want to live the, the trauma again. And they, they think it's not worth it like, to, to do it. So it's, it's very difficult to, to prioritize today, but I do not envision, unfortunately, uh, a justice sector in Syria capable of, of carrying that, that mission. Let me just take a, a question here from um, law and public policy professor Susan Page. What advice can you give to others who want to establish a similar process in other war-torn countries, for example, South Sudan? Very, very important. Um, when we started, as Jack, we had on our board a very great supporter and helper from Cambodia, Yuk Chunk, who was the head of the documentation center of Cambodia. And Yuk has done this work all together, and eventually the DC CAN, the documentation center of Cambodia, was physically shipped to the tribunal of Cambodia, it became a big part of the tribunal evidence is his work. So we asked Yuk, hey, can you help us develop the methodologies of our work? I was like, no, you have to develop it yourself. We pushed him a couple of times, and then we had the question, is Yuk supportive, really? He's on our board, but he's not supporting the organization. But doing the methodologies ourselves, one by one, step by step, mistake by mistake, learning by, by, by doing, was the right way. And that's what, what he was trying to advise us, basically. You could copy-paste a lot of models, but it's not going to fit you. 
and the cookie cutter approach basically is, is not going to work. Um, you have to be local and cater for your local people. For example, informed consent and the state, at the end, people have to sign their statement. Not a single witness or a survivor is willing to sign their document, regardless of what's happening. So we had to write something in our methodology saying if people decline the signature, we record in our own handwriting that the person agrees to the statement but decline to sign. So you have to cater to your, to your people, to your constituents, to your situation, and work with the locals that, with the level that keeps them or makes them comfortable to contribute to your work because this work, unless it gets a general public support, more or less, and people buy into it, they're not going to believe in it. They're not going to share information. A lot of times, Syrians get frustrated with international developments around Syria. So we go to interview a survivor who already arranged with us. I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. What's the point? So yesterday, a hospital was bombed, and nobody spoke about it. So I'm not going to do it. So people lose hope and interest in what happens. But they gain hope again when they see, oh, there's a resolution the UN passed about humanitarian cross-border operation for a year. I'm like, OK, somebody cares about this, so we'll do it. Or they see a similar witness testifying in a court in Germany or Sweden, so they understand there's actual real value of this, this work, and they want to carry it forward. It's going to take a lot of passion and, and, and a lot of, of time and resources and uh, lots of gray hair, clearly. But uh, uh, yeah, it's something. If we if we can help by any any means, we the database as a tool itself is available. Uh, you can download it even without talking to us. Just have someone with IT background can run it. But if we can share anything, we're happy to do it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Will Kyle, and I study U.S. foreign policy and international relations from the Ford School. Uh, my question was, what is your um, assessment on the prospect of creating a more democratic and pluralistic uh, Syrian government uh, using some of the more moderate faction within the Syrian civil wars, such as in Idlib uh, at this, uh, with the Syrian National Army? Or do you think that there are no moderate factions left currently in the Syrian civil war and it's just more um, that the, um, the more radical aspects are going to um, sabotage that? Oh, very, very important question. Um, but let's let's agree on the definition of what's moderate rebel would mean. Is it moderate as of extremism? Because there's a lot of groups that are not extremist religiously, and they're not going to kill anybody different, and they're not going to kill women and abuse people. However, they're bad. They're still bad. They are not extremist. They're controlled by Turkey, and they work as mercenaries. And Turkey shipped them to Libya to fight in Libya, and then shipped them to Azerbaijan to fight against Armenia. And they're going to ship them to Qatar to protect the World Cup in Qatar. There's lots of Syrians being trained in international uh, security firms to be, to be used in that, in that way. So the moderate definition is that groups are willing to respect the human rights, are willing to sit on the table and agree and disagree, but not use violence against others. That does not exist, unfortunately. Most of the armed groups involved in some sort of violations, regardless whether they're extremist or not. And the ones who are not extremists who are getting support from countries like Turkey, um, they are involved with violations and they do not have a decision to themselves. They, they're not independent. Their decision, they're just implementing what's being, what they're being told by, by Turkey. Now there's of course clear international humanitarian law, international law principle that if you supply security assistance to any party, you're responsible for what, some of what they're doing. And that's why we're trying to hold Turkey accountable. We're trying to file against Turkey with the European Court for Human Rights against some of the violations committed by Turkish-backed groups against the Kurdish population in northern Syria. Turkey is not a EU member, but they're member to the Council of Europe, which you can practice jurisdiction over them through the European Court for Human Rights. Um, and that was, that was a very big dream for Syrians like years ago that the rebels controlled like two thirds of the country, literally, before Russia intervened militarily and helped the Syrian government tip the balance again. And the opposition coalition was recognized in court. They were provided the seat of the Syria state at the Arab League, but not at the UN, clearly. Um, there was more, like, and also a lot of narrative around, like, hey, how about the opposition government join the ICC agreement? Would that allow the ICC to practice jurisdiction over Syria? Or, all these narratives were entertained 
and somehow, but with one unfortunate steady line of deteriorating reputation and, and ethics and anything like positive about those groups, let alone they were losing the ground. They do not control enough area to claim any models. So look at the other side, maybe. Look at the Kurdish forces who are much better, more organized. They listen to the U.S. because the U.S. is the only supplier and donor for them. They commit violations, recruiting children and bringing them to the force, arresting activists. They get calls from the U.S. and they, they correct the action a little bit here and there. Still, they have some bad records in, in certain areas like children recruitment and housing, land, and property violations. Yet, they are not even recognized. Like, nobody recognizes them. Not in the Syrian constitution, not by the central state. And when the WHO, the World Health Organization, start working against COVID in Syria, they su provide supplies. They told the Kurdish forces, you have to get your supplies from Damascus. You have to get your vaccinations from Damascus. Because as a UN entity, we can only work with a member state. We're not going to work with non-state actors. Well, clearly, Damascus was depriving them from anything. Um, this is another problem with the UN when they do not understand how to work with a non-state actor. So the solution, they ended up getting what they want from the Kurdistan government in Iraq, illegal, across the border, without listening to anybody, without going to Damascus. Um, but even they control active third of Syria with oil refineries, all the oil resources in Syria is there. They are not recognized by any, anybody. And um, Syria is, Syrians are obsessed with the centralization idea. So honestly, for reasons they don't even know, but they don't want to see anything decentralized. Although if you look at a lot of the successful examples are places where there's a level of decentralization, not necessarily to be a federal federalism, but there's some level of decentralization in the Middle East. So unfortunately, I don't see that happening by any moderate group, whether they're religiously extremist or Qaeda affiliate or not. They're unable to pull anything together. I think tagging on from that, maybe we could talk even a little bit more about the UN and the challenges in working with them, some of the sort of worst examples related to hospitals, mm -hmm. and also then efforts to um, stop the veto power mm -hmm. yep. related to atrocities. Being yeah, present. so two things we can highlight here. So the UN in general, because they are the UN and because they only work with member states, they worked on the conflict with a classic textbook approach. Basically, uh, the, General, the Human Rights Council in Geneva established the Commission of Inquiry on Syria in August 2011. It's been 10 years, and the Commission of Inquiry was never, ever granted access once to Syria. A lot of the Syrian territory was out of of Syrian government control, and they could actually just cross the border and go in, but they do not go without a consent because they are the UN. Similarly, the independent and impartial, international independent and impartial mechanism for investigative set up by the General Assembly, they do not go inside Syria, even if they can, unless they get an invitation by member state or agreement by member state. So the only way to do it without a member state approval is to go to the Security Council and get a resolution. And uh, that's where Russia and China are waiting to veto any resolution that the Syrian government doesn't want to pass simply. And because Russia is protecting the Syrian government um, at the international stage. So the UN crumbled a lot in lots of their files, including protection of civilians, including, including the protection of protected entities like medical forces, hospitals, uh, war, like um, people work in the medical field. The UN designed what's so-called deconfliction mechanism, and they requested from all the field hospitals that's operating informally in Syria to share their information with the UN. So in turn, they share it with the fighting parties so everybody avoid bombing those sites. Of course, they shared the list with the Russians because they have Air Force, and Russia ended up bombing every single hospital from those on the list, every, every single one. So clearly, Russia used the coordinates of the hospitals as a guiding uh, list, not as a list to avoid. And they bombed all the hospitals, one after one. The ones who were rehabilitated again and reestablished, they were bombed again. And clearly, those bombardments were targeted because some of the attacks were double tab, where they hit the hospital, wait half an hour, and they hit the hospital again. So to ensure any rescuers came to the site are killed as well, not, not only the, the medical staff. 
So that was a big scandal in the UN in Syria, really. Because like when you pressure all the hospitals to give you the coordinates, but then you supply it to a party to the conflict who's actively bombing them and you're failing to protect them, that's, that's problematic. Only one hospital in Aleppo, for example, survived the Russian bombardment because they declined to share their coordinates. Very clear, like they're not gonna share it. They're hidden somewhere. And of course the Russians bombed around them a lot, but never hit the hospital exactly. But So this is one, one aspect. The other aspect is the, the siege that the Syrian government imposed in lots of towns and cities where this area is out of the government control. They would siege it from all sides, cut all the supplies, water, power, uh, no food in, nobody out, no medical assistant. So the locals end up digging tunnels and connecting the areas to the next area to the next area. And they did that really astonishing level of tunnels in some places. The UN did reports on this. Um, they handed the draft report to the Syrian government who ended up editing the UN reports and calling them hard to reach areas instead of sieged areas. So they scratched all the sieged areas and called them hard to reach areas. So the Guardian came in 2016 with a set of leaked documents showing the track changes of those documents and how they were edited by the Syrian authorities. And this is problematic because the UN, you should say, and it's, it's very, very interesting how the entities work. The UN from New York, for example, the Security Council sponsor uh, uh, a ceasefire and a resolution for safe passage, so for, pe for people to leave Aleppo during the siege of Aleppo. The UN from Geneva, the Commission for Inquiry, call it a war crime and say that was a displacement of population, was not a safe passage. It's a safe passage only when you have an actual option to stay, but if you decline to stay, you're gonna be killed. So you were actually forced to leave. So how are UN in Geneva calling the UN sponsored resolution in, in New York contributing to war crimes was really astonishing. So this is the place where Syria is the place where international law was maybe a little bit redefined and rethought about and realized that it's not sufficient. It's not doing what, what's, the, what's supposed to do. And how the UN system is all really messed up because of one member state able and willing to shelter a war criminal. And here's the, the veto use, Russia used the veto power 16 times on Syria to veto resolutions in Syria, sometimes two days back to back, like in two drafts, but they don't wanna pass anything they don't like with the Syrian government. And that's not gonna end anytime soon. The US does that all the time with Palestine, Israel. They, they did it, uh, um, China used vetoes in, in different occasions. Um, there's a small initiative called the French Mexican Initiative to limit the use of veto power when it's related to atrocities and human rights violations. And from the P5, the only two who are willing to give up their veto power only during atrocities is the UK and France. But not only China, Russia, the US doesn't want to agree to this because it's problematic. So we have, we have that, that inconsistency in the, in the Security Council side. Uh, and sometimes it, it's questionable, like if you look at the airstrikes or the missile strikes President Trump conducted in Syria, twice when the chemical weapons were used. From one point of view, like yes, using chemical weapons against population is not acceptable and it violates a big international norm and the Syrian government should be punished. But then you look at the legality of the action. President Trump did it without a Security Council resolution, not even with a Congress agreement in, internally, domestically. So it was not actually legal, if you want to put it in a very narrow legal definitions. Of course, it cites different, uh, different uh, frameworks. Um, but the second time, so 2016, the chemical weapons used, Trump did uh, missile strikes. 2017, it was used again. And there's a big session in the Security Council to organize a reaction, and it was a fight between the US and Russia, and they ended up suspending the vote till next morning because they have to vote in it. So the US, UK, and France ended up conducting the airstrikes at night without even going back to the Security Council in the morning. Like, they carried the strikes at night knowing there's a voting session happening tomorrow morning. So when the P3 or the P5 deal with the UN in a very disrespectful manner, like, yeah, what are you gonna expect from other member states and how you expect the UN to function? I don't think the French-Mexican initiative is gonna go anywhere, really. It's very important, it's put forward and led by one of the P5. But unfortunately, like, I don't think the UN is gonna be solved, like, reformed easily around this issue. 
I know we're coming to our end of our session. Sorry, I'm taking long answers. Yep. No, we're exactly on time. So do we need to wrap up? Yeah, okay. So I'd like to thank you so much for joining us in person Absolutely. and your generous donation of your time uh, all day. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> to my, certainly no, my I want to thank, yeah. thank everybody who show up in person. Thank you very much. And for our guests as well and audience online, thanks for your presence. And uh, thanks for the Dunya Center, Professor Ratner. Thanks to you, Professor Pierce, for moderating this. And it's been really a pleasure discussing with everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you.